hello, hello, hello. Leavers and believers, friends, Romans, countrymen, everybody and anybody in between. Welcome to Leaving Hillsong. If you've never joined us before, this is a podcast that talks about leaving Hillsong and other mega churches that we've seen spring up and thrive around the world. Over the last, what, 20, 30 years, it's just exploded. My name is Tanya Levine, and I wrote a book called People in Glass Houses. And that came out in 2007, after I had spent two years with the most wonderful editor at Allen and Unwin in Sydney. And she spent incredible time with me going over my work, and it's, you know, one of the only opportunities you ever really get in life to have your writing so closely examined and assisted every word every comma that kind of thing and then you know she went on long service leave about three months she went away and while she was away I got a phone call a week before the book was due to go to print in 2007 and they uh they called me from Alan and Unwin and said Yeah, look, we've had legal advice. Uh, We're dropping the book. Thanks, anyway. And it was really strange because we had been to lawyers from the beginning to establish what the defamation limits would be and what could be published, what couldn't be, all those kinds of things from the beginning. So it was really strange to hear that legal advice had changed. And many, many, many years later... I was told through a number of sources that it was due to Hillsong pressuring Alan and Unwin. But it makes the introduction of today's guest even that little bit more special. David Hardacre is a veteran journalist in Australia and for a number of years he has been working with Crikey magazine. Remember Steve Irwin? Crikey! That kind of thing. I don't know exactly where you'd put it on the political spectrum. It's not right. It's not annoyingly left it's respectful but speaking on behalf of people with not very long attention spans it's a little bit complicated do i just read the sun and the new york post and when the news story started like flowing thick and fast about the houston's and hillsong and brian himself one of crikey's foremost journalist walkley award winning journalist david hardacre started writing more and more articles I mean there were more and more issues at hand and then something else happened and then something else happened and eventually Brian was charged somewhere in August of 2022 with concealing a serious indictable offence and Mr Hardacre followed almost every issue of worth to do with this corporation until one day he decided to turn it into a book. That a book Mine is the kingdom, the rise and fall of Brian Houston. Just recently came out, published by Alan and Unwin, because the peak of Hillsong's success, along with Brian's notoriety for one thing or another, coincided with Australia having a Pentecostal Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, and he very proudly referred to Brian Houston amongst others as a mentor of his. And then there was the very famous desperado effort uh, to get Brian into the White House to pray for President Trump whenever that whole escapade was, while denying that Morrison and uh, Houston were in any way inappropriately involved, even though at one point it looked like they might elope. So, you know, there's been a lot of change at Allen and Unwin and in Australia. It's a fascinating book. I didn't know what to expect. David has gone to an incredible amount of work, unravelling all the business connections and the intersecting with other pastors and ministries and tax laws that are relevant and all kinds of things you're going to have to see alongside covering some of the standard issues, the scandals that we've seen, some of it is not easy reading. Unfortunately, his father, Frank, the serial child sex offender, 
goes everywhere that Brian's reputation goes. Mud sticks, it seems, and so do skeletons from Lower Hutt in New Zealand. But it is a really interesting take. We have not had in our little circles the opportunity to hear at length from outsiders, especially writers, and we discussed this in this pod. David very kindly agreed to speak with me and talk about the book and what it was like for him and what he learned about fearless leader or former fearless leader along the way. It was an hour's conversation. I'm cutting it in two. Pick up with part two as soon as possible. Thank you for joining us. Kick back and enjoy. David Hardacre, the author of Mine is the Kingdom. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Tanya. It's good to talk. Thank you so much for your time today. We're all pretty excited to hear mm. what what you found. I mean, I guess starting off particularly as a an outsider as such, but yeah. as I'm reading, you know, you've woven biblical stories and references mm. and a, all right through the text. So you've obviously got some kind of uh, grasp on the Christian story. What I mean, Without getting too personal, what's your background? How did you yes. grow up? Obviously not like this. No, no, no. Well, I didn't grow up in a Hillsong setting or even any real, you know, weekly church attendance sort of setting. It was very, very much, you know, a, what do you call it? A, an Easter and Christmas family that I was in. Anglican, I guess you'd call it, but pretty, pretty lightweight Anglican. So as a matter of fact, you know, thanks for re- uh, mentioning all those biblical references. But I had, I had to, I had to learn a, a great deal okay. and, you know, I, yeah. And I, and I found just a couple of people who one particular uh, a friend and uh, a new friend of mine in West Australia, who herself had grown up in a very strong evangelical Christian home, but she's since left that, but she was able to actually help me understand and sort of navigate what phrases actually mean and what. Uh, you know, what references really do mean to a Christian ear as opposed to a non-Christian ear. So that that was really uh, a very big thing for me. Indeed. Yeah. This is, oh, this is an incredible volume of work. I, I didn't know what we we're expecting. And you've threaded together so many mm. different parts, so many different pentacles, arms of this massive corporation. <laughs> How did you do that? I, mean, I love that you have done it because, you know, one of us did it, it would be considered bitter, whereas you can just be the, the huh. devil, the media trying to tear down the church. How do you, if there's an old expression, yeah, how do you eat an elephant? Where do you start? Like, how do yeah. you? Yeah. Look, I found that really difficult uh, and thank goodness for a good editor. Often the way, of course, is to go uh, chronologically. But, you know, chronologically in this case means back all the way to New Zealand with, with, with uh, Frank Houston's deeds, which, you know, are really unsavory. And, and I just thought, oh, I'm not really sure people do want to know about that, you know, and if it is really getting us to what this, the, the meaning of this book really is. But anyway, look, I was persuaded to do it that way. And I'm glad that that, that happened. Yeah, it does unfold, I think, quite well. And I think the reader gets to understand that sense of, destiny, you know, oh. God's word, that God's, God had this future mapped out for Frank and, and for Brian, as, and, <laughs> as they and, see it anyway, put it that way. This is also devoted largely to, you know, a Australian political yes. environment. Why is it, it, I it, mean, you're it, a political journalist, yes? But well, you know what? I just, I, I wouldn't call myself a political journalist. What I would call myself is a, a really curious and yeah, but they call them investigative journalists. But yeah. what, what is that? I mean, investigative journalist is someone who's just trying to dig up another couple of layers to get to the uh-huh. truth. But uh-huh. I, what I thought, you know, to, the big value to me, Tanya, was you know, the more I learned, the more it seemed to me that there there was a real political dimension on the Hillsong story, much uh-huh. more than I knew when I started out, and, and I think much more enveloping that I understood. And at the very start of the book has Scott Morrison together with Brian Houston, Ah. 2019, when both those men are really at the very apex of their power, 
I mean, COVID was to kick in not too mm -hmm. far after that. And, you know, you know the story all too well of the way uh, Hillsong unraveled uh, in the in the following years. But it, but so it is set in 2019 on the stage of, you know, the Hillsong Annual Conference. And uh, up comes Scott Morrison. And he's, you know, he's welcomed as a hero, mm -hmm. Jenny. And, uh, you know, to me, as the more I came to understand about the particular religion that we're dealing with, the more I could see its influence on Scott Morrison and how he was walking in two separate worlds nearly all the time at once. And I just found it really, really, really interesting that there are things, I mean, we, I imagine we'll get to this, but, but you know, the story that I tell to, to a secular audience is, 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 the, is when Scott Morrison proclaims his 2019 election win as a miracle. Yeah. You know, and that yeah. is like, you know, most people who aren't Christian, I think, thought, well, it's just like a miracle mm. you know, when when Penrith beats, yes. you know, West Side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's not, you know. And so, so that, I think, you know, being able to put those pieces together was really, really illuminating for me. And that the, this incredible ability that Scott Morrison has learned, I think, over years, over his entire life, really, to be able to talk to two audiences at once. I mean, to weave those metaphors, yep. those references, yep. not not unlike your own book, in you know, in, mm. in a way, those slip those things into language, and it's not it's not even subliminal. Uh, there was also a miracle, I believe, when yeah. Morrison had a successful IVF mm. round. Gosh, yes, uh, that's he, right. You know, which is yeah, it's it's clever stuff, isn't it? You sort of wonder who was was speaking from from the lodge. Was it Brian or was it? Scott Morrison. <laughs> well said. Raise it there, the IVF story, which Scott Morrison tells a lot. Uh, and for those listening who don't know the story in detail, the Morrisons struggled for more than a decade to have their first child. And that first child, Abby, was born on the 7th of July, 2007. So that is 7-7. Seven, seven. Now, so that was translated for me to explain that this is a you know, I think a really sort of special reference to God intervening in Scott's and Jenny's life and what a special person this made Scott out to be. So he has told, Morrison had told that story several times. He told it in his first speech in Parliament, I believe. Then after he left the Prime Ministership, it became even uh, more pronounced. He told a story, I believe it was to the Margaret Court's Pentecostal Church in, in Perth where he said, well, look, on the 6th of the 7th, 2007, Jenny was well and truly ready to give birth. And, you know, I'm saying, well, gee, you know, God, why, why, why are we waiting? Why are we waiting? And then you know, when, it, when it clicked over to the 7th of the 7th, 2007, I realized that you know, God had a sense of humor. And uh, I thought, wow, well, that's really... Terrifying? That's... Is that the... terrifying? I mean, that's, this is a man running a country who's what superstitious because yep. Justin Bieber actually made a big deal of getting in, engaged to his wife, Hayley Bieber, on the 7th of July. Oh, wow. Okay. So with a prime minister who has the same religious intelligence. Yes. I mean, and they're both successful people of Justin Bieber, but you know, I don't mind if he's superstitious and yeah. casting the dice or whatever. Uh, that's some strange stuff. I mean, well, and so that is actually really important, big stuff, because as you say, yes, this is a, this is the prime minister, not Justin Bieber, and you know what it opens up is this whole question of, you know, does religion influence politics? And that question has just been too hard for journalists to go to. Yeah, they, they've just got a big black line that you don't cross here I've, because that's I've, awesome. What? I I say because the, I mean the book towards the end expresses some of your frustration at how yeah. uh, different media outlets just yeah. didn't want to know or yeah. could, I guess couldn't believe yeah you can't be serious well they that's 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 right I mean yeah look there's this there's this whole kind of you know uh, unwritten rule I guess in journalism 
which is that, well, you don't, you, you know, there are some things that are personal and they don't, you, you don't, you don't talk about them. You know, one of those is you know, if, 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 if somebody in politics has an affair, well, we don't, you know, we don't talk about that. Mm. No, you know, with, with Scott Morrison, you know, he put his religion front and center in a way that others didn't before him. I mean, we, we're used to kind of, a, okay, so like a John Howard or a Kevin Rudd or a, even a Tony Abbott where, all right, Christmas, Easter, they'll turn up at a church, there'll be cameras outside. That's kind of it, really. But, you know, Morrison did overtly invite the camera crew into his church at Horizon Church in the you know, southern suburbs of Sydney, you know, and, and, and was happy to be uh, captured with hands raised. He, you know, he did, as was, as we've been discussing, overtly discuss God's intervention in his life. He did that a lot, you know, to call on election a miracle win. You are, that's what you're doing. So, and, you know, then as towards the end, I mean, when he lost the prime ministership, his first appearance was in his local church uh-huh. you know, after, and then not too long after that, he made, you know, a big, he gave pretty much a sermon over in uh, Margaret Court's church in in Perth. So this is someone, and at the very end, of course, when he's leaving Parliament, he devoted a long time to, you know, to to discussion of religion and the importance of religion. So, you know, we can't just go, well, gee, it's not polite, it's not right. I mean, you know, Scott Morris is actually saying, you you know, he's, he's giving us absolute permission to do that and we should one of the big barriers though tenure has been journalists don't understand particularly this sort of religion they, you're they telling just, me I, yeah, yes. I mean and that's what's so fascinating is that accounts of this and that's why I, I'm quite grateful I think a lot of us will be that you have um, put this all down so factually uh in the order that you have because Journalists don't get it and insiders are often unable to escape their own bias or their own trauma or, you know, so you very yeah. rarely get accounts like, like this. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm agreeing. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going, yeah, yeah, because I, because what you're saying, I really appreciate. And, oh, uh, one of a kind. Absolutely yeah. one of a kind. Or it's got, you know, religious guilt over it. So there's. Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm not being, yeah, you know, like I'm saying to you, I'm not being bitter and I'm not, an, uh, mm. I just, yeah, this is just well, very clear. Well, that's, that's really kind of you to say that I wanted to approach this as a journalist should, which is just to say, right, we've got this extraordinary situation of one of the most powerful people in Christianity, Brian Houston at the time, and one of the most powerful people in Australian politics, just Scott Morrison. Mm. And what does this mean something? You know, it does mean something because, you know, in the early 2000s, the idea of a, of, a, of a Pentecostal follower being in parliament, there was only one, I think, and that was in the South Australian parliament. It was Andrew Evans, I believe. That, but yes. And he was in the upper house. Now, you, you fast forward, you know, now 20 years on from that. Well, you know, not even 20 years. And, you know, there's Scott Morrison in the lodge and there's Brian all over the world. I mean, just, just Hillsong taking over the world. And you think, well, that, that is just a hell of, of, of an arc. That's just a hell of a trajectory there for this particular, you know, little religion as, as, as I have known it to be. It, it is, it is actually something quite extraordinary. And that's the phenomenon that I want to document mm-hmm. and in a very factual manner as thank you, as you say, which is to point out. The, the growing power and the growing influence and to unpick what is the, I mean, the, 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 there's the great levels of mystery that sit behind all that. And that's really what I wanted to unpick. Uh, right. which, what, I mean, and what did you, like, what do you find? Because uh, you've been working for Crikey. It's yeah. a, how would you just, I mean, how do we describe a Crikey to people outside of Australia? Yeah. Okay, so look, Crikey calls itself an upstart online publication, yeah. so which is probably the best thing. You know, it, always, it, always, it says of itself that it punches above its weight. So what it means is that it's 
it's it's more it's it's not so much the New York Times and, and Washington Post or the Sydney Morning Herald. It's not it's not a big mainstream publication. It's a little one on the fringes. I, the one which I think it's most like in America is called the Intercept. Okay. So the yes. Intercept, yeah, an online where look, some people call it you know left left leaning, and in some respects that, that is true. But what Crikey did in relation to particularly the, the my work was they said, okay, look, yeah, let's 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 break the protocols. Okay, so if the mainstream media is bound by these rules that say, well, we don't talk about religion, well, we don't talk about whether Prime Minister Scott Morrison is a liar or not, you okay. know, that's that those these are words we don't use. But you know, those those traditions or those 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 customs, they can hold you back from journalism's real aim, which is to get to the truth. Okay. And so uh, you know, thank heavens for Crikey, which gave, which has the space and gave me the space to be able to just break the rules a bit and to get to the truth. So, you know. And, I, and, and as you were publishing articles, I mean, it just seemed like there was something else coming out. And well, there that's was... right. I don't know. Well, so cool. That's really true. And, you know, the, 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 my outstanding uh, impression or take out from having done all that work is the is the is is you know look it's the passion and the sincerity of people who really believe their religion and that's yeah. it's those yeah. people who I just kind of go well I'm so a indebted to but but I admire you know because look, the thing I didn't know was that how hard it was to be inside something like Hillsong and then speak about it publicly in a negative, let's just call it a negative uh -huh. manner. Sure. We'll just say, we'll just call it a negative manner. But, you know, really, uh, you know, there was a collection of people who I think are so passionate about the, 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 about the, the good things about their religion that they, they, they want to kind of save it. And to me, that's yeah. just wonderful yeah. because, but, but, but it's, but what I didn't realize was the incredible risk that awaited those people and the incredible punishment that they'd be subject to if they, if they were known. I mean, I, you know, I went to be asked to not use somebody's name. That's okay. Fine. But, but the reason being that they would, would be scared of being cut out of their networks or you know, having absolute uh, retaliation taken upon them, that really opened my eyes. There you go. You could you could say I'm naive about I, that, but I was really surprised by uh, that. Uh, not at all. Look, I mean, I had left the church myself by the time I was yep. 2021 and about 2021 20, years old. And, mm. you know, I'm still amazed at the level of destruction that is possible when people, I mean, they don't even have to speak out. They just have to kind of not participate as happily uh, or ask a few yeah. questions and, and yeah. as you know, they can lose, yeah. they can lose everything. I mean, you were working on these articles for a couple of years, pretty yeah. much intensely from my memory, from, from when uh, Brian Houston was first charged with consent. Yeah, pretty well, that's pretty much that, it. That's yeah. when, it, I mean. Yeah, that's when things got more intense. At what point do you decide, you know what, I'm going to really I'm going to make a, you know, I want to go on record about this. I yeah. want to look at this closely. And I, and I guess I'm asking you, is that why? Why there's so many different little characters in our political landscape. Uh, what yeah. is you about Brian? And I guess while I'm asking you that is, you know, what did you see sort of why you were focusing? Who is this man? Well, yeah, what do you make? Because, yeah, well, no, I'm sure, Tanya, because to me, you know, it, it, there was a point where it morphed from being well, very soon it morphed from being a, a religion story to being a business story. Okay. I mean, you know, yeah. amazing. I mean, if you just look at the church as a business operation, it's, it is, it is truly amazing. I mean, I, you know, I did not know the, the, the amount of sort of reliance on, you know, charities as a driver of 
the church's financial health, mm. you know, and then you go, well, okay, let's look at the fairness of that. Let's look at, you know, what sort of transparency there is. And then you discover that, well, actually, you know, there are a lot of exemptions that this church and other churches are taking, uh, having benefit of. And then, then you are really sliding into uh, the, the ability of this church in particular to influence politics. And then I, I suppose that the biggest leap, which I was actually a little bit surprised by, was the idea of the Seven Mountains Mandate, which I'm mm -hmm. all about. And uh, I don't know if those who are listening, you know, are familiar with that. But I, I thought, wow, that's 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 really something. The idea what's, that what's the seven what's the Seven Mountains Mandate for the on an issue? Yeah, issue? yeah, yeah. Well, it's the idea that you should project your religious power through the sort of seven pillars of society. One of them is government, one is education. You, you might have to help me out here. You know, one is business, the arts, sport. And so and so you see that, well, yeah, so these sort of seven major spheres that run that run our society. And, you know, what well, one of them is politics. A chief one of them, I guess. And then you look at the United States, you look at the you know, the growth of uh, evangelical Christianity and its influence on the Republican Party there, and the and the other that you're going to get a whole lot of politically influential pastors standing in the White House, you know, with Donald Trump. And you think, wow, this is this is something bigger than um, you know a church that did really well from Borkham Hills. Uh, uh, and, well, that's see, this is where I think tenure. That's like where the most. I think Australian observers of Hillsong are kind of stuck in this idea that it was this really great idea that took off in the northern suburbs of Sydney where there were suburban families looking for some meaning in life, you know, a safe place for their kids, uh, and, you know, the, and, the, and the idea of an aspirational middle class, the, the, the idea of a prosperity through religion kind of charmed mm -hmm. with an aspirational middle class. And that's all good. That's fine. But that is just like I think I now know to be the tip of the iceberg of this story. Absolutely just the tip. And so just to to understand that there is a kind of a plan, you know, a, a bit of a system of systematized effort here to bring influence through each of these main sectors of society we call the seven mountains. That's 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 really big, and then you actually see that it is inactive. Very, it's a, it's an infiltration. It's a subtle yes. infiltration. It, it uh, is. It, it is. That was a big eye opener for me, and then to understand that. Well, actually, here we go. We've got a we've got uh, someone from Pentecostal religion in the in the lodge. You know, in the yes, in the yes. Minister's name and camera. So, wow, and it's actually happened. <laughs> it's actually happening now. Australia, I know, is different to America, and it can't. You know, there's some probably more limits on the powers uh, that a prime minister can wield, as opposed to a president, and the influence certainly of uh, evangelical Christianity and religion is less than America. But you know, here it is. This is what this is. To me, that was the political reality of what Australia had entered. But no one's writing about it. Like no one, no one even saw right. it. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. What? I mean, I think Brian's more than happy to cruise along being a scene as sort of a bumbling, you yes. know, doesn't yes. really know what's going yeah. on. You know, he knows everything that's going on. Uh, yes. What did you, what did you think of him going in kind of thing? And what did you make of him? Well, okay, so, well, what, what I had to do in order to do this book properly was to actually listen to quite a lot of what Brian was saying. I'm sorry. And, you know, to, to, to. Uh, you know, the, the online sermons, etc. Now, I I think I had a reaction to Brian that maybe not a lot of people have. Well, I I kind of liked him, can you? Uh, you know, a lot and, of people like him. I mean, just, yeah. Well, uh, in your book, you quote him as being one of the top twenty pastors in the world. Yes, and, yes. And and I've met. You know, I had no time at all for him. I found him thoroughly dreary. But some people will <laughs> tell you. Regardless, yeah. they're, they're now dislike for him. He was the greatest preacher they ever saw. So, yeah, I can understand that. I, I look, I, 
you know, personal admission. I mean, I, 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 I ended up sort of listening to Brian because I enjoyed it. I, you know, I listened to it more than I had to for the purposes of research for a book. I, 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 I like, I like, I, I, what I like about Brian is that he has, uh, you may well disagree with me here, but to me, a self-effacing character. He was oh, able the self-deprecating to... stuff's great. Yes, it's self-deprecating. Thank you. That's Very effective. He's just... you... Yeah. No, well, sorry. No. sorry. Neil, look, yeah, you know, your interpretation is is darn valid. I, I mean, I I just thought, look, you know, compared to, ah, uh, you know, some religious people are very pompous. Yes. Face it. And so here you've got a guy sort of making fun about his, you know, his receding hair or, you know, his bald spot or his. Uh, uh. And he is genuinely dorky. I mean, that. Yeah. The mystery, yeah. Brian, like, who is this yeah. goof guy? Yeah. Or is that, you know, an act? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I kind of like it. And I, I, uh, uh, you know, so you, you, I suppose you, you see the multi dimensions because there was a level at which I thought, you know, uh, you know, with this, with this learn, finding out about his father's Frank's past, I, I do think that must have been shocking. Really? I, I just do. Uh, you know, I mean, he, I mean, he, Brian often said, well, you know, my dad was my hero and to find this sort of stuff out. He, he did have a well worn phrase at one time, which is that it was like, the planes in flying in the Twin Towers, yeah, as you know, and which captured his you know, state of utter personal destruction on learning these things. And I, I, you know, I can't, you know, he's a human and that would be just shocking. There'll be all sorts of debates about what he subsequently did with that knowledge. Uh, but just that knowledge and, and I think, you know, a, a large chunk of his life was spent in the shadow of that. And, uh, and I think it's, I think it's pretty hard. Because if he lived the first part of his life in service to his father and then his father's kind of medicine and the, you know, the remaining part of his life cleaning that up, it's, it's, you know, not a, a, a pleasant situation. No. Yeah. No. Well put. And, you know, the, the extent to which, uh, you know, alcohol and anxiety tablets, uh, were a response to that. I mean, he, he, he says it is, and yeah, maybe so. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty, uh, you know, Brian's, Brian's life is, you know, it's, 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 it is a remarkable big life, whatever you think about Brian, right? It's a remarkable That's big cool. life. You know, as he puts it, when he started in Lower Hutt, you know, in, a, in what he calls a state-owned house, and, you know, he, he did end up standing in the White House, <laughs> you know, so it's, yeah. So, that's right. Yeah. Right, I go off, yeah. I go off to, but, um, yeah, I mean, it, a huge look, look, that's a, that's amazing. In, oh, oh, I mean, we also do. Yeah, it is they're, they're incredible, and a very very strong bunch of people too. Very, they just you can't kill them off. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but I mean, growing up, Brian would say, "Well, oh, yeah, we're going to fill stadiums for God." Right, and you'd think, yeah, oh, yeah, right, you. Yeah, we're here in Borco, you know, we're here in Borco Mills. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're in a warehouse, but yet, you know, yes. keep drinking, buddy. And, yeah. you know, it, yeah. more than uh, yeah. into the Oval Office, like like Jeff Bullock, like you quote Jeff Bullock, he, he yeah. does have a way of being sympathetic. And it's interesting that you were able to actually engage with that yeah. and not sort of, oh, yeah. And And look, you know, I mean, highly successful people, can be obnoxious, but they're not, they're, they're never all bad because if they were just all bad, they wouldn't, you know, you can sort of say the same of Donald Trump in a way, you know, pe some people find him charming, you know, you and I might not, but, but Tanya, I think one of the other really, really big things that I learned was, uh, the introduction of the Pentecostal leadership model that Frank Houston was responsible uh, for, uh, whereby the senior pastor had all power. And that was uh, formalized in the constitution of churches and in the, you know, the board constitutions. And that, that is that whole idea of being unquestioned, unquestionable, basically having all power and being anointed by God. That, that's, an, that's 
an important realization to make, and it's really something when you make it. And also, you know, you can translate that into Scott Morrison's behavior too. I, I was just, I mean, I'm, I'm, one of my most jaw-dropping moments, I, I'm amazed that a huge, a bigger fuss wasn't made of this, and you, you do talk about it in the book, is Morrison um, electing himself in his five ministries. <laughs> after dark, yeah. after everybody went home, he's swearing himself into cab. <laughs> what? I mean, and yet, and yet it's normal. Uh, it, 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 it would be normal thinking in a Pentecostal circle. You're entitled. Take what's God's. You know what I mean? Take it for God. So that, what you just said there is very illuminating, eye-opening, amazing, right? Because... And that's part one. You know, I wasn't going to even do an ending, but I thought I'll tell you a couple of stories. What does one do when one's book has been dropped a week before print? I'll tell you in part two. But interestingly, a couple of months ago, former Prime Minister Scott Morrison attended a community event where a former close confidant of Brian Houston's was in attendance and Mr Morrison said hey tell Brian I'm praying for him and this person said well you know I don't have anything to do with him anymore but it was an interesting shift shoes on other feet or something both of them actually have books coming out shortly Brian's is about Brian and ScoMo's is about like how he knows all about Christianity and he wants to give it to you because it's the right way. So that's super cute. They can both tour America with their own delusions and hallucinations. Veteran journalist Roberta Lee Houston is writing her husband's autobiography. So it should be a fascinating tale of smiley faces and Borrowed expressions from movies like I'll have what she's having and build it and they will come and you know that sort of thing. And then maybe it's time the rest of the story actually got told. I mean they talk about this state house that this wretched family had to grow up in and those were, those were the good days. Before that they were living in a boarding house. Hazel fought tooth and nail for that council flat, thank you very much. They sure are a fascinating bunch. It's like the Partridge family with the... Adam's family, ah, uh, throw in a dash of Kennedy scandal and misfortune and you've got the Houstons from Lower Hutt. Okay, well it's MIC, see so you real soon time. I guess the easiest way to be kind to yourself and other people is to think like, what would ScoMo do? What would Brian do? What would they do together? And do the complete opposite. Scott Morrison was famous before he became Prime Minister for stopping the boats using any technique possible to keep asylum seekers on refugee boats from entering Australia. It's a tiny place, Australia. There's not much to share. And he really did illuminate the kind of Christianity that people question, like, oh, Scott Morrison, you're such a Christian. Like, why are you so horrible to everyone all the time and cold and heartless? And don't care if they die. It's not like Jesus. But it seems to be this kind of, just like his Border Patrol policies, it's not about inclusivity. It's not about welcoming people and making them feel all right. It's about keeping the bad guy out. Just like good old Brian. And I think one of the best ways to keep living Hillsong is to have a read of this book. It's so different from anything you've read before by someone who has left a church or a religion or a journalist going in and saying, hmm, what is this? I'm certainly not making a commission. I'm just saying. We'll talk soon. Bye.